never forget. For those who witnessed the tragic events of September 11, 2001, this was the promise we made, that we would never forget that fateful day and those who served and sacrificed because of it. It was, in some ways, an easy vow to keep. How do we ever forget what we saw and felt the day that the world, as we had always known it, ceased to exist? But what about those who came after? How do they remember things that they never saw or feelings that they never felt? How do they understand things they were not there to experience? How do we pass the lessons of 9-11 on to a new generation? The answer is as simple as it is profound. We have to tell them about it. Where were you on 9-11? 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 I got up in the morning and flipped the news on because in 2001, we didn't just get up and check the weather on our cell phones quite yet. You weren't born yet, your sister was only one years old and when I got out of the shower the news switched to the uh, breaking news. I was at home and my phone started ringing like at 6 30 in the morning. My at a clock radio and so my alarm clock went off and I pressed snooze and my alarm clock was the radio. So in my halfway asleep delirium I was thinking something had happened close to here. So I was like, something really weird happened at like the convention center or like the Rose Garden or something like that. But I mean, I was young and I was like, that's weird. We were in Chicago for a baseball game, flew in the night before 9-11. Of course, he lost his cell phone in the cab the night before 9-11. And the next morning we turned on the TV in the hotel and found out that the world had changed. We got a phone call uh, from uh, the kid's grandmother, and, they, and the, it was simply, turn on the TV. And sort of instinctively, I knew that if you turned on the TV to any channel, that they was all watching the same thing. Something significant had happened. My boss calls me and he says, have you seen the news? A plane hit, a, hit the tower in New York, and." And I remember saying, Jason, that's not funny. He's like, I know it's not funny, turn on the news. I was getting the kids ready for school and I was doing my daughter's hair um, and she was sitting on the bed watching the TV with me and she said, what movie is this? And I said, it's not a movie, honey. Um, something really bad is happening. And my dad was sleeping on the couch. A lot of times he would just fall asleep watching the news. And my dad like just had Fox News on like all day. That's all he ever watches. And then I woke my dad up and I just said, Dad, Dad, you know, uh, looks like a plane hit a building. And, you know, he, he was like, he's like, stop lying, you know, because I would mess with him all the time. And I'm like, no, Dad, I'm serious. I was actually um, dropping off my three-year-old, I think she was three at the time, uh, daughter at a babysitter's house. And the, she came to the door and she had tears in her eyes and it was devastating. So I don't remember my drive from that place to work at the time because I was devastated. It was just like surreal, like 
I, I can't even comprehend what you just said. I was actually with a group of other guys uh, up in Lake Chelan. And um, that morning, about six in the morning, uh, the, the, there was a knock on the door, our bedroom door. Of course, we were asleep. And one of my buddies stuck his head in the door and said, hey guys, we've been attacked. And uh, of course, coming out of a, a dead sleep, uh, you're thinking, what does he mean, we've been attacked? We shot up, myself and my roommate just shot up. And he, I re I'll never forget this. He looked at me and the first thing he said was, we're never going to be the same. We're never ever going to be the same. I was actually in bed <laughs> and my telephone rang at this ungodly hour and it was my son calling to tell me I didn't have to get out of bed and I didn't have to go to work today. And so I was glued to the TV for several hours until it was time for me to go open the office, which my son had told me I didn't need to go because I wouldn't be selling any airline tickets. But I took the portable TV and went into the office, and he was right. The phone never rang. And then the following day, the phone rang a lot with people wanting to cancel their flights. Um, we didn't have a TV in my office, so literally uh, I got an AM radio that Californians carry in their, the trunk of their car for earthquakes, uh, brought it into my um, office, and listened to the, the news coverage all day. Uh, I was actually in St. Louis, Missouri in a meeting at the airport uh, Marriott, uh, which is right at the, uh, the airport in St. Louis. I'd been in New York just two days before. Yeah, my dad uh, came and woke me up. He's like, hey, James, get up. Uh, come look at the news. And I was like, why? I'm sleeping. And he's like, well, a plane just ran into a building. And my first instinct was like, well, what an idiot. He just ran into a building. and. So the, one of the medical team managers for one of 28 federal terrorist and disaster response teams through the Department of Homeland Security and FEMA. And, um, and on September 11th, I was uh, working in that capacity with one of those 28 teams uh, which responded to the Trade Center. And I had moved to Maine from New York City just a couple years before then. So I was working as a resident and saw the first tower go down and turned to my residency director and said, I'm going to New York. And he said, no problem. And then I got a phone call from one of my mentors, one of my residency uh, advisors and professors. And he told me, come with me. Um, I'm on a federal disaster and terrorist response team. And I guarantee you, you will see more if you come with me than if you go to the, your hospital where you used to work. And he was right. And we were the first federal disaster and response team into the Trade Center after the collapse. It was intense. Uh, we, were the, we were the primary search and rescue team on scene along with the New York City Fire Department. I happened to be uh, on Manhattan Island um, the morning of uh, September 11th, 2001. Uh, we were in town um, that night from Boston, uh, the night before rather, uh, to go to a Red Sox-Yankees game at, at, uh, in the Bronx at Yankee Stadium. And, uh, um, but we did end up staying for the game uh, because uh, it just had gotten later and we were wearing Red Sox gear and um, the Yankees fans after a few drinks aren't necessarily the most pleasant to people wearing Red Sox gear in, in the Bronx. Um, uh, I was woken up um, by um, my girlfriend at the time, uh, her uh, brother lived in Spanish Harlem. He spoke Spanish, um, and uh, I spoke a little Spanish. My, my girlfriend spoke Spanish, and but all he had was bunny ears on his old TV set, and um, and so all we got uh, was the Spanish um, fuzzy Spanish channel um, of with the, the the actual footage of the plane hitting uh, the tower, um, and then uh, Spanish commentary. Um, so it was all happening very fast, very fast Spanish, and uh, I could catch every other word. Uh, we woke up that morning, and um, uh, groggy, I guess, will be the word we'll use for it. Um, and uh, uh, they, uh, we quickly realized that something crazy was going on. Um, and as we were sort of trying to huddle around this little TV and figure out what was happening, um, uh, the, the second plane hit. 
So we watched the second plane hit. And then that's when I knew that it was something bad. And they're saying, you know, whatever, I don't remember the exact words, but that another plane has flown in to the buildings. And as I, I was just like, oh my God, and I, as I was getting out of the car, I tend to talk to myself a little bit. And I said, like, I'm pretty sure out loud, I said, that is not an accident. And then I went into work. At that point, he was like, yeah, I think we're under attack. And, and then we watched, uh, you know, the other plane yeah, it crashed and the one uh, hit the Pentagon and it was that morning I was like, Dad, I'm, I'm going to go fight in this war and he, yeah, he's like, I know you are, uh, I don't want you to, but... I learned very quickly that, um, you know, our country was under attack mm -hmm. and that they ordered back all of us uh, back to work because at that time we had also heard about uh, Flight 93 uh, crashing in, in uh, Pennsylvania, as well as uh, the uh, plane that hit the Pentagon, killing 55 at the Pentagon as well. Um, so we didn't know where it was gonna end, so they called us all back to work in preparation that there might be further attacks in our country. I do remember staying at work for about 48 hours and then uh, the fire service uh, we're like one big family so we have a network where we can uh, tap into um, New York City uh, fire departments uh, needs and welfare and I do remember us scrambling uh, firefighters from uh, urban search and rescue teams up in Seattle um, to as well as teams from around Oregon to send back to New York. We had no idea what was going to happen. We had just kind of heard the Pentagon. It's freshman. I don't know what the Pentagon is. I was stupid. I didn't care. Um, but I knew it was important and I knew it was a government building. Um, and then we had been hearing information about another plane and then hearing about the flight that crashed in Pennsylvania. And that I think really hit me because we were hearing phone calls from that plane. We were, as like they were happening, like there was, um, we were hearing exact, like not the exact actual phone calls, but like what exactly was said, talking to someone who was on the phone with them. And then it would be like, and then there was screaming and then it went static. And that was terrifying. Feeling of dismay, uh, sadness, uh, because as firefighters, I knew when I saw that first World Trade Center Tower One collapse uh, that there were uh, numerous firefighters inside the building knowing that we had just lost many brothers and sisters in the fire service as well as uh, police, officers, police officers and security personnel. Um, so very, very proud of those people knowing what their destination, what was going to happen to them as well. They kept replaying the first tower falling uh, and then I remember the second tower falling. But I thought that was the, I, I didn't click that that was the second tower at the time. You know, you're sitting there watching and then you see the tower fall again, uh, but then you notice there's not another one next to it. As you'd expect, TV did not do much justice to what the real event was like. And I didn't see anything on TV until after I got back. You know, I, I, saw, I saw the first tower go down. I didn't even see the second tower go down until after I had come back. I, as, as a person who was born in New York City and who grew up for, for the most part in New Jersey, just outside of Manhattan, um, the Trade Center was very personal to me. I have a lot of friends that would take the subway into the Trade Center every morning. My grandfather was a judge. His courtroom was in the South Tower, um, and I used to visit him there as a child. And fortunately, he, he had long since passed away and was not in the tower when they went down. Um, just block after block of abandoned, completely quiet Manhattan streets. I've never seen that in my life. Manhattan is never quiet. Even at four in the morning, there's people wandering around, people bang, you know, leaning on horns and, and cars everywhere. And to see that, just no power, this ghost town, it was weird. It was very bizarre. Chicago's a very frightening place to be when there's no noise. It's a noisy town with cabs honking and airplanes flying over and cars. And it was so quiet you could hear a pin drop. Yeah. And they said it was just spooky. Because they were thought, man, is my radar broken? It's like, no, because there's no airplanes. There's 
nothing. They're normally a, a, a piece of airspace that's just full of airplanes is just quiet. One thing that struck me was that it was a beautiful September day, not just in New York City, but also in Klamath Falls. And there's an air station there. And so typically you can hear the, air, the airplanes going overhead. And it was so quiet because all the planes in the entire country had been grounded. And so um, that seemed odd, you know, that here it was such a pretty day and that you didn't hear anything. And I was on my way to work when the second tower was hit and fell. Um, and so what is kind of interesting about that is that I didn't see it happen. I only heard that it was happening. I didn't have a frame of reference for what it meant if jumbo jets hit buildings. Um, I certainly didn't think that I didn't picture them going into the building. I thought maybe they clipped that. Like, I just didn't have a frame of reference for it. So I kind of, I guess, had a visual image of it all day. But then when I saw it, it was like almost being traumatized again because it was just, I was like, oh my gosh, it's, I imagined it awful and it was so much worse than what I even imagined. Normally we would have a flood of tours all day and I would run tours, you know, we would run tours about every 15 minutes. Um, but I think over the course of that day, maybe 10 people came in because it was like the whole world came to a complete stop. Everybody was saying, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is real. And that's what we were saying is, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is real. And it was like, am I watching, a, you know, a movie, you know, a thriller action movie that, uh, turn the channel, you know, this is really terrible. Um, and then she went off, they went off to school and um, that day they had the TVs on at school all day long and the kids came home pretty traumatized. They didn't really understand what was happening and um, they went straight to their rooms and were pretty non-communicative um, for a couple days. Um, it was a very scary time. My son Ricky was in first grade at Trost and his, his teacher had this wonderful uh, habit or, or thing that she did with the students is when you came to school that day you would take out a piece of paper and your crayons and and draw something and um, I, I have the picture from Ricky on September 10th and it's it's a picture of three flowers um, two houses uh, green grass and and a, and a sunny sun in the in the sky and on the next day is a uh, building on fire, red flames coming out of it, a plane crashing into it, and, and a news crew taking a picture. And, and I, when I saw that second picture of Ricky, I, I thought, um, this is childhood's end. In my geography class, we oftentimes would just ab abandon uh, the, the days uh, scheduled lesson if there was some breaking news story. I always told my students the first question a geographer would ask is where and then the second question would be why there. The ultimate question that my students would ask is you know, why? Why is this happening? What's going on? Why, why is this? I was young. I didn't really quite understand what was going on. I just knew that it was a big deal. So we were all allowed to call our moms or our dads or our parents or whoever we needed to call to be like, hey, I'm okay, but there's something going on. So if you don't know already, you should look at the news. So I called, I had this like tiny little Kyocera phone cause like phones had just come out. And so um, called my mom and I was like, hey, you gotta wake up cause something weird is happening. Uh, and then we just watched, we just watched TV. We watched the news the entire day. Um, when it first started, it was just silent in the room. It was just complete silence. But what was really interesting is that we still went to school. <laughs> um, but there wasn't a lot of school happening that day. I think we were all just, all the school was just like shocked. We were just like, are we, I guess we're staying. I even had a volleyball game that night that like wasn't called off and it was, I mean, it was just so weird. The, I, the roads were empty. The roads were empty. It was. It's like everyone was just holding their breath and waiting. One was uh, Cheryl Garrison. She was a geometry teacher at the high school. And um, she was always the type of person who was very intuitive to what was going on with her students and you know how they were feeling as they entered her classroom. 
but I think especially that day it was so important how she um, engaged us as we came in uh, and I think most of the classes that I, I remember that day we just sat and watched the TV um, and she had the TV going on but she was also engaging us in conversation um, uh, helping us a process really right because uh, we were 14 years old how, how do we process what we just saw actually even thinking about it now makes me almost cry again I had to go in the bathroom and cry and then come back out and be all cheery like everything's gonna be okay kids but I really did was really worried about that it was not gonna be okay nobody could concentrate and I, I, the kids couldn't talk, concentrate either because it wasn't like it was kindergarten. If it was younger kids, I think when the kids came to school, we would have been like, well, let's just pretend everything's fine and we'll sing songs and have a cheery face. But kids were coming to school knowing what happened too. They came an hour after I got there and they're, you know, they're young, they're, they're becoming young adults. They're middle school kids. They're they know what's going on. I went through the entire day without breaking down. You know, I just tried to, you know, be strong and, and, and to be, um, you know, steady, you know, as, as a teacher for my students. And then when I went home that day and, you know, and I saw the television reports, you know, and, and the replay of the, the planes, you know, flying into the World Trade Center, at that moment, I, I, I just busted up and, you know, broke down in tears, and it was the first time that day. Um, but it was all the emotion just pent up and built up during the day. All of the students were pretty, um, not, as, not as upset as the teachers. The teachers were very shaken, and now as a grown-up, I know why. Um, but we were mostly, I mean, there were some people who were like, all of, I mean, like part of it is that all of us had somebody in New York. All of us had somebody who was going to be on a plane that day. So there was a lot of, we can't get a hold of so-and-so, calling our mom, hey, did you get a hold of aunt so-and-so? And the phones were down. Texting wasn't really a thing. Social media didn't exist. It was just, I think that they're okay. You know, yes, we can read about an event like this in, you know, the history books. Uh, we can... We can watch film, you know, we, we, we can see, uh, you know, the big picture of, of such an event, but really what, what made itself known, you know, with that particular day is that it wasn't just one big event that took place. It was hundreds and thousands of personal stories. The day before, September 10th, uh, I was on the phone with one of my colleagues uh, from National Geographic Society. His name was Joe Ferguson. He was their education program director. And I had just worked that summer uh, in Alaska with Joe and his colleague, Anne. So as it turns out, we had a project the following week uh, scheduled in Florida. We discovered that our, our flights were going to be um, arriving about the same time in Florida at Miami. And so we agreed we'd find each other in the airport and then we'd share a ride, you know, out to the hotel that we we're gonna be at. So, you know, he, uh, he says, well, I'll, I'll see you next week. And then, yeah, I'll see you then, Joe, have a safe flight. Turns out those were my last words to him. So on the 12th, sure enough, I, I get a phone call from National Geographic and I said, oh, I've been waiting for your call. I, I'm expecting our project's probably canceled. And they said, well, Tony, yeah, it's canceled, but this, this call is worse than that. I said, what do you mean? And he said, Joe and Ann uh, were both on the plane, and that's all they needed to say. I knew what they meant. Joe Ferguson and, and his colleague, Ann Judge, they were, they were both on the plane that went into the Pentagon. So I lost two good friends that day. And then I remember having to call my fiance at the time because I didn't know what was going on. I said, you know, oh my God, I'm getting married in six, six weeks. This could really hurt, this could really hamper some things. 
and um, Mr. Braden, the teacher I worked for, relieved me in the hallway and I went into the principal's office to take an emergency call from Chris, my fiance, um, kind of explaining what was happening. They weren't sure if they were gonna take the sailors from the recruiting district and put them out on a ship in Puget Sound. He wasn't sure what was gonna happen and the clinching words to me was, I don't know if we're gonna get married yet. And so here I had just mailed our wedding invitations the week before. And um, so we were a little nervous about what was gonna happen. <laughs> it honestly felt like everything was still and then paused. It's like the whole world was just holding its breath, waiting for the next shoe to fall. It kind of felt like the day just went in slow motion. Um, of course, I was worried about Chris. I didn't know where he was. I didn't know when I would get to talk to him again. I started thinking, okay, what do I need to take? How do I break it to my fiance that we can't get married? Not right now. I've, you know, I'm being recalled. You know, it could be Bremerton. It could be going to San Diego. It could be back to Florida where I came from. I didn't know. So I tried to come up with ways of telling her it's okay we're gonna get married maybe not when we're planning but it's gonna happen this is not gonna stop that postpone it maybe but it was kind of a reality of his sense of duty um, and commitment to the Navy was very important and so as his future wife it was really important that I support his commitment and his duty to to go help if that was what he was called to do. I remember my dad was just sitting there and he had this really serious look on his face and and he said you know this changes everything for us and I'll never forget him saying that and I said what do you mean he's like Emil these are Middle Eastern people like this is going to be bad for us and I think what my dad was was basically preparing us for was the fact that uh, like hate crimes you know that because we were of this descent that at some point people were going to come after us. You know, I had a Canadian sticker on my car because I was a pretty proud Canadian at that point and I was living here and he told me to take the sticker off and he said put an American flag on it, like an American flag sticker and I said I don't want to do that. <laughs> like I grew up in Canada, that was home and that's what I identify as and he said no you need to do it because people need to sh see that you're proud. And I think fear, not for myself, but more for my parents, because I could see how my dad was reacting to this and his worry. And um, you just don't know what people are capable of. I went to the grocery store, and it was as if everybody was kind of moving in slow motion. And uh, a friend of mine that I graduated with, I saw her coming toward me, and she was holding each of her children's hands on each side. And our eyes met, and as we passed, we just stared at each other. And I know what she was thinking, and I know she knew what I was thinking, which was, we're in big trouble. We're, we're going to war. Um, and that image has popped up into my head numerous times over the years, um, because it was two mothers um, scared for their children's lives. Uh, and, not, and not just that day, for a while, it was, um, you know, just living in anticipation of what could be next. You can't just, it's like, with COVID now, you can't just stay home and stay in bed because there's a risk to your business. And I knew that there potentially would be people who would need assistance. And so um, because of flights being canceled, it canceled cruise lines, um, it canceled a lot of different things. And to get home, we flew from Chicago to Minneapolis, Minnesota, Minneapolis, Minnesota to Indianapolis, from Indianapolis to Fort Worth, Texas, or Dallas, Fort Worth, and finally to Portland. And when I got to Portland, I bawled like a baby. I was so glad to be home. There's no place like home. At the time, I was president of Cambi Telephone Association, uh, which is now known as DirectLink. Uh, but I was there, uh, our company, Cambi Telephone, had invested in two or three other telecommunication companies that were suppliers to us and I was chairman of the board of one of these companies that was headquartered in, in Illinois. We would meet in places like Chicago or Kansas City or St. Louis, so all the board members could come in from all over the nation. We could meet in an airport city uh, for convenience. And so I was stranded. Uh, St. Louis at that time was a TWA town. That was an airline that no longer is in existence, but that was their hub. 
but I was there on a United Airlines ticket, and there weren't going to be any United Airlines flights home for over a week. So I had to, through the chaos, um, go to Plan B to be able to come home, and I bought my wife a new car, and I drove it home to her <laughs> so I could get home by Friday of that week instead of 10 days later. Well, obviously, my first thought was, I want to get home. The need and the want to get back to family was tremendous. And then the fear started coming in about uh, the second plane that it, uh, that crashed, and then the, the Pentagon. And now I'm wondering, okay, so what's next? Is it Portland, you know, or is it what's next? And there was not a lot of information coming from the White House and coming from the government about what was actually happening. So most of it was just complete confusion, like no idea. We had no idea what was going on. And that I think was the most terrifying thing is it could be anything, it could be anywhere. That was the first day that I ever carried a weapon in my truck because I wasn't sure if, if this was going to be, if this, I, it just, you're scared. On, on September 11th, of course, we, everybody just, everybody was just paused. Nobody, nobody knew what, what to do, what not to do. On September 12th, um, off subject, I was playing in a golf tournament. And the golf tournament was still on, and the golf tournament was at, um, a golf course called Colwood. Colwood is on Columbia Boulevard, and um, it is Colwood is in a rock's throw distance to um, the airport, Portland International Airport. And it was so strange that day because I'd played at that golf course before, and y you can hardly hear each other talk when you're playing because it's just one jet after another jet after another commercial jet. There was no planes that day. They grounded all, every plane was grounded. And so the only planes that would take off would be fighter jets coming out of the uh, National Guard uh, unit. And, uh, and so that was really strange. Coming home from the golf tournament, I was super tired and it had been a long day and came home and went to bed and was woken up by uh, the, alarms, the, fire, the alarms going off at the shop. And of course, at the time, the shop still belonged to grandpa and um, but I got the call and so I ran down to the sh jump in the truck ran down to the shop and as I was coming around the shop the corner of the shop I saw uh, Chris Mead well I didn't know it was Chris Mead I saw someone running down the driveway and you know me I grabbed a golf club out of the back seat of the truck and stuck it out the window and I was gonna take him out because I was gonna catch that person breaking into the shop and he's waving his arms, telling me, Lee, it's gonna blow, it's gonna blow. And I'm like, I'm thinking, who's he chasing? I'm gonna run him over. And as I looked up the driveway, because it was, it was one o'clock in the morning, the shop was on fire. And in that instant, I thought, the terrorist came to the shop. But it wasn't, so. It was a rough few days. And the shop didn't burn down and everything was fine. But, you know, my, I guess my emotion with that is just that it was, uh, those, those couple of days was just a really rough couple of days. The, the kind of the thing that they were trying to cheer us up, saying that it, it looks like there's an airplane stuck in the other side of the building, which was, you know, seemed like kind of a little funny way to, to to talk about your building being on fire, but being that the towers had just gone down, it was kind of a, not a joke, but it was just kind of a, something that we, trying to cheer, cheer us up about what was going on. Um, but it was, uh, it was, it was really, really an interesting moment because you know, you, you, um, you know, you're thinking, uh, you're thinking, the terrorist, you know, whomever they happen to be, you know, wh where are they, where are they going to strike next? You know, and it's and it was, uh, it was just a real wild time when that was happening. Yeah, I remember later in the day, pretty much the, a lot of the town of Canby uh, 
got together at the Fine Arts Center over by the high school and uh, there's you know, probably five, six hundred people there that all came to, I guess, mourn together and support each other as a community. And uh, that night, I believe it was that night, I can't be for sure, it might have been the next night that all the churches and pastors came together um, at Canby High School um, uh, in the auditorium there. And uh, uh, we prayed together and we talked about what had taken place. So it was, I think, a, a kind of a wake-up call for all of us, all of us. Uh, it was honestly also one of probably the time in my life where I've felt and seen the most unity in our country. It didn't matter who you were, or where you came from, or what you believed in, like, everyone was united around um, what happened on 9-11. We had that shared experience. It brought the country together at that time. Um, you know, I mean, everybody was united in the fact that uh, how dare them attack our country? How dare them attack our freedom? You, you were proud to meet American that day. You saw the President of the United States rally as best he could. I think Canby has always been the type of community that uh, rallies around when something happens. It's right after 9-11, uh, the next you know, days and weeks following, um, this community was tight. You know, people looked after other people and people, you know, would check on people and watch after other people's businesses. And uh, it, was, it was just a, a real um, nice time in, in can be for uh, just the community support amongst one, one another. Canby has always been very much uh, patriotic towards our military as well as our country, you know, and I'm very proud to be part of Canby. Um, but I think that for New Yorkers, the New Yorkers I met, um, it was it really brought people together. Um, it, it, more than anything else, it, any differences that they may have had, um, they, really, uh, they really set aside. It was nothing short of beautiful. We had kids coming down, young kids in their 20s, wearing dusk masks and carrying boxes with sandwiches and Gatorade trying to feed us. And we kept telling them, get out of here. This is an unsafe area. We still thought the buildings were unstable around us. And these kids were... Um, Asian, African, East Africa, they, they, these kids from the Caribbean, these kids were from all over the world and it was such a beautiful New York moment because they were risking their own lives just to come and, and help in the way they could. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, everybody was you know, kind of under one umbrella, like united as Americans for, for a while. There was no, uh, nobody cared about left and right, everybody was like, yeah, you know, worried about their country, and everybody was you know, patriotic for a while. I mean, flags were a big thing. Um, everybody had a flag on their car, on their lawn, on their house, everywhere. You would wear it, you would, whatever. Flags were everywhere. Everyone was trying to really understand what being a patriot was and what it meant to them. So, Canby was really everyone came together like it was like a time for nationalism time for everyone to come together and Canby was small I mean it was smaller than it is now and we all kind of just came together like there was brethren everyone was family everyone was telling their stories and everyone was listening which is not always a thing Fred Myers did exist it had, was new Fred Myers was new so like when you'd go to Freddy's everyone would be talking to each other chatty smiling, um, being, we were a family, like we were one big family. You know, the, the community was whole, you know, at, at that time. You, you look at what this country did by and large, you know, all the way down to the small communities and uh, how everybody felt about each other. Uh, and it, uh, it's crazy to see how far apart we've come from that. And, and what I remember uh, just witnessing was was how uh, all across our country and in every community even even right here you know in Canby you know people pulled together and uh, you know when we found strength and comfort you know with each other 
And, and one of the memories I have was, you know, we had a gathering over at uh, the high school auditorium, uh, just uh, uh, interdenominational gathering to, to, to pray, you know, for, for peace, you know, and to pray for the victims of, of that day and, you know, and, 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 and of course there was all of this uncertainty, what's going to happen next? So we started trying to get out, uh, you know, get on the phone. So I went outside and I'm, I'm trying to call and everything's jammed up and it took me quite a while to get through, but I finally did get through. But in the meantime, um, the street um, around us was just, I mean, I still have these memories like imprinted on my brain of a, a woman running out of a uh, the apartment uh, building next door and she was wearing her bathrobe and slippers and she's on the phone and she's just screaming hysterically and she's like running out of the 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 building like she's going to do something like she's going to run down to the twin towers to to do something but there was nothing she was i mean obviously not equipped in any way to do anything um but she just was screaming. So I didn't leave the house for days because it was so traumatic. I just remember watching the TV for days and hoping that people, you know, were alive. Um, and we were crawling our bellies um, through the through the collapsed structure to look for void spaces where survivors might be, and we would breach into cars that were covered in rubble. And it was so surreal to be inside of this this architectural bit of chaos where you're looking at at what used to be 150 feet above you or maybe 100 feet above you. Um, we, you know, my team searched the entire subterranean mall underneath the Trade Center. We searched all the surrounding buildings. It was intense. Buildings were still burning while we were in them. Um, you know, uh, the worst case scenario handbook, which is kind of a joke book that was, that sold millions of copies, we found it completely undestroyed, lying, uh, lying half opened on top of building five next to a piece of the fuselage from one of the jets. I mean, it was surreal that this, that this would be there. It started to get um, bizarre because you're constantly under the fear that another building's gonna crash and land on top of you. And these are some very big buildings. There was an enormous amount of fear. You know, I was in the basement of building five when it went up in flames. Um, and we all jumped on the hoses that the firefighters purposely leave just for that kind of a reignition moment. And we were putting it out from inside. We had no idea how big it actually was. It was pretty darn big. And you know, the hours, the time of that day doesn't really translate to me anymore because mm -hmm. I just have these sort of memories of things. But we were, you know, you were just sort of transfixed watching the same broadcast that everyone else was. Eventually, at some point, we, we decided we needed to eat because um, we hadn't eaten and this was it was already well into the afternoon at that point um, we went around the corner and there was a deli uh, that was uh, just handing out food to people they weren't charging anybody anything they were just giving people food um, and just I mean but just everybody tears just with us tears just crying hugging each other like in shock and disbelief that this was happening uh, nuts just absolutely crazy. It, it took two things that I love. I love skyscrapers and I love airplanes. That would be like, that would be like turning my bicycle into uh, an instrument of death. You're sad, you're hurt because of, you know it's a lot of people that, that died in those buildings that day. And the images, that was the other thing. Of the peop of people who were jumping, out of those yeah. buildings, it was just, it was super, super sad that day. I felt real sadness when you see people, you know, running down the street crying and they're bleeding and you, there's nothing you can do. You're on the opposite coast and you can't help them, but you want to. Uh, I remember about people not knowing what to do. Uh, you know, the shock and, you know, the terror and the, the tears and the, um, you know, all of those emotions were, were going through. I remember feeling terrified. Um, I remember my mother was alive at the time and she said, I didn't think we would ever live to see another Pearl Harbor. And I remember feeling like it, it was so uncertain what the future held that for the first time in my life, I didn't feel safe in America. 
Yeah, it, it was scary. Nothing had ever happened like that in the United States. It's something that you always expected to see somewhere else, um, you know, a bombing or something like that going off. Um, so for it to happen here was, you know, there was a lot of unknown. Um, and I think that's kind of why we just kept going. There, there wasn't really um, a, a protocol for what to do when something like that happened. So You know, and I used to think that never happened here because we're America and we're strong and we have a military and we're safe. Terrorism on our soils was a foreign concept. And I think that's what really confused a lot of people. It's like, what, what's going on? We're supposed to be this, you know, world power, and yet this happens? How? That those kinds of events steal the innocence of, of a community, of a, of a country, that, you know, you are, you are all of a sudden thrust into a very serious, very sober realization about what, what, what the world is like around you. And, and it is a boundary that you never come back from. You know, once you've crossed that threshold, you never come back. Uh, it kind of reminded me, uh, I was in high school, I think my freshman year, when um, I was in uh, the PE lockers after, you know, gym, and people started talking and people started crying. Um, I said, what's the matter? And they said, um, President Kennedy was shot. For me, the death of the president, the most protected man in the world, that he could be shot, that we could be left without a president, that a, 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 a beautiful wife would be a widow and two beautiful children would be without a father, that that, that was my childhood's end, that, that I recognized that things worse than I could imagine can happen. So uh, that was, that was the, sort of the big thing for me uh, was seeing the, uh, this incident uh, through my children's eyes. The world is a scarier place than I had imagined and it may be even scarier than what I'm watching now. So it was, it was just the floor falling out from underneath me. Sadness, definitely. Especially knowing, realizing I'd been there the year before. I saw those towers standing in all their glory. I was on top of the South Tower in July of 2000. And I thought, those pictures just became priceless. Um, in like the weeks after 9-11, how did like church work? Did it like, was it different? Uh, yeah, it was different in the way that uh, it crushed attendance <laughs> records, you know, just, I think people were just hungry and they were looking for answers and they needed security and safety. And I really get that. We didn't ignore what had happened and the lives lost. I think you have to acknowledge, not just acknowledge, uh, but empathize with the families that had lost loved ones. I, the severity and the suddenness of losing people who were just going to work. I mean, all they were doing was going to work and they lose their lives. It took a while, you know, it took months uh, of walking through it and talking about it, not ignoring it. I want your generation to know, you know, I want your generation to be equipped the best you can be equipped. Um, because when 9-11 happened, uh, one of the first things I, I did, along with talking to the congregation in general, is I went directly to the youth group. Uh, I went to the kids because while that is so traumatic, it would not be the last time that your generation, Tanner, is going to experience difficulties, and you already have. You already have. I think that the loss is obviously the biggest impact, right? The, just the, the terror that those families and those people experienced in the building. Um, it's something that I still can't bring myself to think about is what would it have been like to be in those buildings on that day um, or to be one of the first responders and actually head into the buildings on purpose. Like I still can't even really bring myself to think about that. Because it's hard losing someone um, that's even ill that you know is gonna pass away. And then you have someone 
just suddenly a lot of hundreds, thousands of people suddenly. It's devastating. You know, the initial feelings were of shock and surprise and just trying to comprehend and take in everything that we were witnessing. Um, and then that quickly kind of morphed into um, anger, sadness. Um, and I, I can distinctly remember the first time that anybody cracked a joke. Um, I think we'd been on scene for three nights. The team's split in half, and so that we search 24 hours a day. Um, we have completely symmetric, two halves of, of, of the same team, if you will. And I was on the night crew, and we would search all night long, and then the morning crew would come and leave us at 7 in the morning, and we would go and try and sleep for a few hours. And um, nobody wanted to crack a joke. We're, we're working with the New York City Police Department search and rescue units, which are called ESU units. We're working with um, the Port Authority Police Department. We're working with the FDNY, and they had all lost friends. And many times we're pulling out respirators from the pile and having them identify which one of their colleagues it was because they wore different respirators. So pretty morbid stuff. And we were searching a building called the Century 21 building, which is just east of the Trade Center complex. And it's a big building. It's probably 50 stories, and it stares right at the Trade Center. So the people that were there had a first front row view of everything that took place. And when we got into the building, we were searching every floor. Um, there's no power, so we're climbing all the stairs. And um, you could see phones dangling on their cords. You could see purses and briefcases left where people just split and ran for their lives. So it was a very weird, bizarre snapshot of this huge, these massive floors, empty offices with people's belongings just left where they ran. Um, and some of the rooms were locked, and so we would have to force entry into the rooms to make sure there was nobody in there. Pretty typical search and rescue fire stuff. And I remember we were about halfway up the building, and there's a device that firefighters use called a rabbit ear, which broke. And, uh, and so somebody had to bring another one up, and they had to run up 20 flights of stairs to get it to us. So we were taking a break and drinking some Gatorade and waiting. And, and, and I'm not a patient person, and I don't like to wait. And so I turned to the firefighters who were there, and I said, I thought you guys were firefighters. What are we waiting for a tool? Let's kick some doors in. And I kicked the door in, and, and the New York City Police uh, Special Response Unit, which is called the ESU, they had one of their crews with us, and they said, who the heck is that guy? And uh, my teammate said, that's our team doc. And so one of the ESU guys said, what's he, a podiatrist? And uh, it was just a moment of levity that finally needed to occur because nobody had made a joke for three days. I didn't... I didn't want revenge. I wouldn't say I wanted them. I wanted like justice. I wanted to find out who did that because there were a lot of innocent people killed and I wanted that person. I wanted justice from that person or those people. You know, a group of men who really had just a, a f I want to go find out who did this and and go um, react and and you know, anger um, amazement, um, some fear, but really more of just a, you know people either have a fight or flight response, and very much in that group it was a f it was a fight response. I'm angry, I'm pissed off. I want to go find out who did this, and I want to seek some some kind of retribution. Yeah, but but angry too. I mean, I I would have to be honest and say there was a lot of there was a lot of anger that was you know. Why are they doing this to us? No, nobody should be doing this to us, and we're going to need to, you know, we're going to need to stand up and, and do something about this. You know, in retrospect, that's probably not the thing I would be most proud of. But I, to be honest, yeah, sure, I was, I was really angry. I remember seeing the true leaders standing up and saying, "Okay, let's figure out what happened. Let's see what we can do. Let's respond to this. We're not going to take this stand. We're not going to." get knocked down and stay down. We're gonna come back up fighting. There was some anger, like, how dare they? You know, this is my home, this is my country. You don't do that to America. You know, and you're thinking, somebody's gonna pay. Somebody's gonna to have to answer for this. Anytime there's been a tragedy that has taken lives, America's always responded. And that's what I was thinking was, America's gonna respond. I don't wanna be on the receiving end of that one because I know what America is capable of. I had just left active duty, so I had just gotten an honorable discharge for my first five years, and I had joined the Oregon National Guard as a flight medic. So I was a medic on a helicopter at that time. 
and within a month I was back on active duty headed to Fort Sam Houston Texas for training and where I would uh, and then from there to the 82nd Airborne Division in North Carolina and off to Afghanistan for my first tour overseas. I was 15 whenever the towers fell so I couldn't yet go fight. I enlisted on September 11th 2003. I wanted to go and I wanted to I guess avenge those deaths of Americans. Everybody we were all trying to get back in to do what we could. You couldn't even get through to a recruiter's office. It was insane. I was motivated. I was ready to sign up but I, I still didn't fully understand what I was getting myself into. Like I was, uh, I was a teenager. I wanted to go, you know, avenge those fallen in our country, and uh, so I went and volunteered to go to go fight them. But it uh, wasn't it didn't really sink in until like uh, I guess uh, flying into Iraq from Kuwait. Uh, we were in like an old helicopter, and flying into the city uh, over Fallujah and seeing buildings on fire and seeing things blow up and then having them say all right time to we're losing hydraulic pressure we need to put drop down here in the city and I'd never been in combat at that point and we had to hop out and do a perimeter around the helicopter and that's about the time where I realized okay this this is real this this is where uh, yeah I'm in combat and I had found out a few weeks later that the ship I had just come off of was the first one called up off the East Coast. And I found out later as well that they had orders that they were to engage and if necessary shoot down any plane that came near the U.S. And that included airliners. And my job would have been to do that, to track those planes and tell the, the weapons guys fire. And that, that brought a sense of reality. Like, I could have had to do that. You know, knowing I press a button, hundreds of people are gonna die. But I have to do my job, I have to do my orders. It was pretty easy whenever, if, whenever somebody was actively attacking us. It wasn't, uh, it was mutual combat. They understood what they were doing. They were trying to kill us, so, it didn't really take any thought behind pulling the trigger. We, it's either they're gonna die or we're gonna die. It was uh, fairly straightforward. That's where most of, uh, I guess, nightmares are born. It's, uh, it's uh, like there was a building that went down and it had a little, little like two-year-old baby inside there and she was, uh, she was, wounded, had got some pretty bad burns, but it was alive, and there's still a firefight going down, and our our medic was able to run into the building and save the baby. Like one day, they, there was a suicide bomber. The man gave his life for his cause, and he just busted out our tail light and popped our tire. Just put a couple rounds through the uh, windshield, and. The suicide bomber just kind of veered off into the center median and stopped. And so it's, uh, like at the moment, I didn't really think about it. I knew the guy was trying to kill me and I had to stop him. So I yelled to the driver, get off the road as I was shooting. And the suicide bomber just never got to blow himself up. He just kind of veered into the center median. And that was that. You know, we were <clears throat> dealing with people that were embedded in the hillsides there and trying to deal with um, and support some army troops that were on the ground and uh, support other aircraft that were there having to do some bombing missions. And it was a very, um, at times it was scary because, you know, we're, if anything had happened with our aircraft, we were over areas that even if I could I had I was in an ejection seat, but the ability to safely like get on the ground and survive would have been very very hard. Once they were no longer a threat, then we'd go up and we'd do first aid on them, try to save these same people that just had just tried to kill us, and so it's uh that's one of the things that helped me to uh, remember that we were the good guys. 
because it's even uh, even these people that were you know actively trying to kill us and kill our friends. Once they weren't a threat anymore, we'd patch them up and we'd do what we could to save their lives. Well, being an active duty military at the time, especially the Navy, it was still fresh in our minds what happened, you know, nine months prior, USS Cole. The USS Cole was in Yemen, in the Middle East, in October of 2000, and a small boat approached her, which they normally do when they're anchored, you know, they bring they take off the trash, they bring uh, food, they bring fuel sometimes. And so the crew didn't think anything of it. But that small, that small little boat was different. She was loaded with over a ton of high explosives. And she hit the side of the USS Cole and caused a 60 foot hole. And for hours, They didn't know if she was going to make it. They thought she was going to sink right there in the harbor. And it got me because where that little small boat hit, I knew some of those guys that were killed. So I started thinking, okay, fast forward to 9-11, okay, I've got to really pay attention to what I'm doing. Yeah, I may know people that, that were killed in this. That's okay. Being in the military, that's part of my job. So I was a medic on the back of a helicopter. We were flying a lot of point of injury missions, um, flying in, pulling wounded out of bad situations. But for them, uh, for most of them, uh, the kids in Afghanistan, we were just uh, uh, another foreigner in their country. I mean, that's they've always had that. It's been uh, centuries of, of constant warfare in that country. Uh, and if it's not us, it's each other. So it kind of was just, okay, well, here's another group that's going to be taking up part of our land for a while. Um, but they were generally supportive because they, I mean, I was there on the ground. Regardless of what people will tell you, uh, they did not like the Taliban, you know. And so they were pretty pleased that we were there to help get rid of them. They would open their home to you if you need it. They were constantly coming trying to give us, give us food. Um, so yeah, for the most part. Yet others, they weren't so nice. But, but for the most part, the civilian populations that we dealt with were great. You know, I had a much different interaction with uh, the local populations, I think, than most, just because of a, a side hobby I've always had that I got to do while I was overseas. I do magic, you know, on the side, and so uh, I did a lot of magic uh, for the kids and stuff over there. It, uh, unfortunately, most of them were in the hospital, you know, and that was um, our medical evacuation missions consisted primarily of uh, picking up wounded kids. Unfortunately, in that culture, life is very, very tough. Uh, and um, a lot of times the parents no longer wanted the kids if the kids were gonna be too difficult to take care of. So the kids would stay in our hospitals until we could find an orphanage for them because the mom and dad weren't coming back. They would tell us if the child dies, they'll take the body. Um, Just different. It's one of the things that, uh, yeah, I'm probably mo one of the most proud of in my life is being a United States Marine and getting the opportunity to, uh, yeah, serve my country. What are some of the biggest impacts that you think 9/11 had on you personally? Well, it, it was huge. Um, with my employer, Camby Telephone, I had an employment agreement, and we normally renewed those every other year, every two years. And we were in the process of negotiating a, a renewal of my agreement. And um, I went back, when I got home on a Friday night after the Tuesday was 9-11, I got home that Friday night. The next Monday, uh, we had a board meeting, a regularly scheduled board meeting, and I went into the board and I told them that I wanted a three-year agreement and then I would retire, and I would help develop my replacement. And um, I was, uh, I retired at 59. It wasn't my plan originally, but I thought life's too short. And I could do it. Um, I had the wherewithal to be able to retire and with a degree of comfort. And um, 
And so I did. And so that's been 17 years I've been retired. I'm 76 now, and I feel great, and I think I'm healthier because I did retire. <laughs> I've got a chronic cough, I use inhalers now, you know, because of the Trade Center, so it's changed my life in a lot of ways. It, it has impacted me greatly. Um, <clears throat> I knew the pilot that hit the Pentagon, and um, it was very traumatic for me. Um, having just had my daughter, I was also going through the whole postpartum thing, so it affected me even more so because of that. Um, a lot of us um, were not prepared for that. And we weren't trained for that. And um, never thought it would ever happen. I remember him because we flew together my first Christmas away from Oregon. And um, he knew that we were all really junior and that we were really homesick. He rented a hotel suite on Christmas Eve and threw us a big party. And that was really rare. He was just a really good guy, really good guy. I flew with him when I uh, lived in Miami, Florida. Sorry for your loss. Thank you. I have PTSD because of it. Um, I was never able to return to flying, and um, I regret that. A lot of anxiety, uncomfortable in really crowded, you know, areas, which was new to me. Um, there's a lot of anxiety and depression that went along with that. And, um, you know, having known what was going on there, I, I had dreams for years, horrible nightmares. But looking back, I wish that I had overcome that fear because that's exactly what the terrorists wanted, was um, to instill fear. And I think we also realized, okay, we gotta look at how we do things. Is it a little more inconvenient with the TSA and things in the airport? Yeah, it is. But knowing that they're doing their job so that we can safely go where we need to go, it's worth the hassle. Took, took many weeks to come out about, um, if, if not months, that um, the FBI did in fact have advanced information of Middle Eastern men studying how to take off a plane and notably one of them one of one of them said they didn't seem particularly concerned about landing the plane uh, but then our uh, intelligence machinery was was so complex and so uh, dysfunctional that that information never made it up uh, to higher levels it affected my husband's job when he was traveling as a scout to, um, he carries a radar gun with him because he checks the speed of pitchers. And it was confiscated from him numerous times at different airports because they would say, what's in this box? And you say, it's a radar gun. You just didn't use the word gun. I think one thing that, um that was personal for us was when we did get to get married a month and two days after 9-11 in October of 2001, one of the things that we did, um, not just because Chris happened to be active duty in the U.S. Navy, but to honor the people that lost their lives on 9-11 whether they were first responders or just innocent people in the towers, um, we chose to leave an American flag up in the sanctuary of the church we got married in just to honor them and show that um, they were represented, you know, that we remembered them. That was just something small that we could do. And um, we choose to do that every 9-11. Um, we stop and we say a prayer and we think of those people because um, there's a lot of children that missed out on getting to have a dad or a mom, you know, because they were in the Twin Towers. And um, so that's important. I think it was sad that it became a very racist issue because it was just one group of evil people and there are evil people in all parts of the world. And 
And the people from the Mideast, the people didn't do this. It was a, a group of vigilantes or whatever you want to call them, crazies. Bad people did it, not, not those governments, not those citizens. And, and it's a real shame. And I think, you know, we have a lot of healing to do in the world. Uh, on the day of uh, the attack, and and after, when when the when in initial concerns were that it, it may be Middle East and that type of uh, thing, that the threat threat may be Middle Eastern. Um, I remember the city manager telling me that he had instructed the police uh, to send um, a cruiser uh, down to one of the gas stations, which was owned by a, 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 a prominent and well-known Middle Eastern man, and he was concerned um, about uh, s some retribution against this person. I was working out one day, I was leaving the gym, it was like a gym in my apartment complex, and there were these four guys that were walking past me, four white guys that were around my age, maybe a little younger, maybe a bit older, and um, I was trying to get by them and they like tightened their wall like around me and I just pushed right through them and they, you know, they said, you know, go back to Saudi Arabia, you know, you don't belong here. I had another incident where I was driving my car and I was at a, at a stop sign or a red light and this guy pulled up beside me and he spit at my window and I rolled my window down and we started yelling at each other and he just said these racial things to me. I think what made a, uh, a lot of people more of a target than maybe I was, was like head dressings, robes, you know, that was a direct, those were the folks that I think had to kind of more worry, you know, and so, so yeah, I certainly knew people who experienced that. You know, I had a, I had a friend who uh, uh, got jumped, you know, by four or five guys. Um, I had another friend whose, whose mother was stabbed you know, um, uh, because she wore, you know, a head dressing and they didn't even say anything. They just walked by her and then just stabbed her. I remember going to church and there were a few, um, few deacons or like leaders of the church. And, um, and they, you know, they said to me, you know, like, I really like you, but I, you know, I really wish, I just want to bomb your country. You know, like, I just think people, there are just animals, you know, and that really like hit me hard that, you know, these are people who are supposedly like leaders talking that way. And um, it just had a profound impact on me because these are people that I looked up to. And to say something like that, like just really cut to my heart. That almost made me walk away from like the Christian faith because in my mind, I was like, man, if these people are like the leaders and this despicable crap is coming out of their mouth, like what does that say for like other people? I, I came back to it and I've you know, been a Christian for most of my life now, but that I think had the biggest impact on me because I felt like if there's any place that I should feel like safe and respected and shown dignity, it would be there. It felt very unfair. It felt frustrating, you know, to have people discriminate against you and, sh you know, uh, uh, treat you like you're not a person based on the actions of other people. My father is a uh Okinawan American. He was born here and uh, he uh, joined the United States Army as an interpreter interrogator uh, with MIS, which is Military Intelligence Service. And his role uh, among the other Okinawan Americans born here in the United States was they had to in interview and interrogate um, Japanese prisoners and, uh, uh, you know, r relay messages and uh, uh, transcribe messages and stuff from Japanese to to English. It, it was really difficult because he looked like the enemy, <laughs> um, and and it was really hard. He was always behind the lines and afterwards because there were some situations, especially uh, the Philippines. Um, they had to protect these guys. It was so unreal for him too to to have to face um, the situation of. I have family in Okinawa and we're fighting against the Japanese and the Japanese had conscripted many of the Okinawans to fight against the Allies, the Americans, which was what my father, his younger brother, who was only 16, was conscripted into the Japanese army. My dad, uh, 
he had to do a job and that's what he did. And uh, I could just relate from you know, college time and then junior high school time, that same kind of a feeling um, that uh, it is uncomfortable, um, but there's nothing you can do with it. You know, I've had names, you know, um, you know, yelled at me and stuff. The funniest thing is um, I don't really look Asian Asian, um, so I'm always, you know, you know, yelled at bad names, uh, either being uh, Mexican American or Native American, so I said, well, if you want to insult me, you got to get my ethnic background right, you know. But a way that I think we failed in our response is in othering people through the process. And um, I think that nations heal better when there's not othering involved. And when you don't, like, you know, we othered an entire religion. We, enti we othered nationalities. And there was significant moments of violence against them and in, in after the event happened because everyone s suddenly had a fear that there was this whole group of people that were our neighbors and then one day they fear we feared they were terrorists to me it really helps us to say we are a community of the world we really are and if we're not able to speak the language we still can feel the uh, emotions you know everyone cries you know everyone laughs everyone's uh, has uh, burdens to bear, you know, uh, in each country. And so uh, looking at that, I said, you know, we just need to come together to try to understand, uh, even though we have differences, that uh, as human beings, we need to uh, come together and support one another. Real impacts, I believe we're just feeling now, 20 years later. And I do believe that the the reaction the government had immediately was too aggressive too soon. Now everybody was upset and wanted to get the bad guys that caused this. And I believe that they got pushed into making a, a, a reaction too suddenly instead of planning something really strategic and go for the bad guy. And instead we punished a lot of people that lived in the country the bad people lived in. We've been at war in that region for so long that it's, it's almost become normal. And that that kind of way of life wasn't normal prior to 9-11. We weren't always overseas. We weren't always fighting kind of these uh, unnamed terrorists and, and kind of um, these covert people that wanted to do harm to us. And um, I hope someday while your generation moves on, that you can come back to a point where you don't have to think that way. I felt a sense of pride too, though, that here's these first responders, these firemen, I get choked up thinking about it, firemen and policemen, not just doing their duty, but knowing that they put their lives in jeopardy and when everybody else was running away from the buildings, they were running to the buildings. There's a pride that comes from knowing that those kind of people are in your community here in Canby. There's people like that in Aurora and all of our towns here, but that so many of them, even people that were off duty, came to help in New York City because they knew that they were needed. I think we all began to appreciate our law officers and our first responders, our fire department more I think we'd taken them for granted before that day, and I think they all found a special place in our heart. It gives me goosebumps thinking back about it. Yeah. Well, the response was very um, fulfilling, I guess is the best way of putting it, um, in that uh, very much like after the wildland fires that we had this last year on September 7th of last year, um, people were extremely appreciative of the firefighters and the amount of work that the firefighters did during the wildland fires. Mm -hmm. What's well, very much the same is that people came by the fire station with flowers and cookies. Mm -hmm. So that was a very, that was a very positive experience to have community members just celebrating people coming out just to welcome us home. Um, tons and tons of signs in the community. Thank you for your service. Anywhere you went, you know, oh, here's a cup of coffee on us, you know, thank you for what you're doing. 
And every year on September 11th, um, over at the Canby Fire Department, we hold a ceremony and a remembrance uh, of the uh, 323 firefighters, as well as the public safety uh, people that were killed that day. We basically start off the day at 8 o'clock um, with uh, some speakers in the remembrance. Um, and then we uh, d do a, an honor guard ceremony in which we ring the, the bill in remembrance of the uh, firefighters and police officers. This year is going to be special in that it's the 20th year. One of the things that I was so proud about, Canby, was that um, uh, our Trost Elementary School had some teachers, including John Van Acker, who um, uh, decided to make a patriotic CD. Uh, he's, a, in addition to being an instructor, he's also a mu musician, got some uh, recording engineers to come in to Trost, and, um, and the kids were able to um, uh, make a CD of patriotic songs, and uh, then they sold those and the um, proceeds went to Red, the American Red Cross. And I was just so proud of our community of taking something so awful and letting children feel like they could have an impact. I'm with a, a veterans organization, um, Veterans of Foreign Wars uh, Auxiliary. And then when 2001, September 11th, came, we were just shocked. We didn't know what to do, you know, and how do we uh, support our fire department because, you know, this hurt them as much. And so um, I asked them and I said, could we do, you know, bring you flowers in memory of those that passed away? And they thought, that is so nice. So we started bringing um, floral tributes to the fire department every year on September 11th. And so uh, that led to, um, you know, another time of, hey, we're also the Aurora uh, VFW, can be Aurora VFW. So um, we had never approached the Aurora Fire Department. So we said, we would like to, you know, present you with a uh, floral tribute on September 11th. Would that be all right? And they said, wow, we, we'd be honored. And I think the most amazing thing was last year, when we had the fires going and everything, uh, because of COVID also. Um, I was able to, you know, just bring down the flowers for September 11th to Canby and then drove over to Aurora Fire. And then they said, we're so sorry, the chief is not here. He and a group is, they went to Detroit, Oregon, to deliver a fire truck that they um, had as a spare because theirs burnt down or burnt up. And I thought, this is the best day ever that we remember on September 11th, um, all our local fire department, first responders, is you just don't forget. So, so one of the things that we wanted to do is we didn't want this to just be something that, uh, you know, the whole 9-11 event you know, to be something that would just bring us down. We have, we have to rise back, you know, bounce back from it. and. Uh, what we had already in place was plans to take part of the uh, grounds at Ackerman Middle School. Uh, in fact, it, it used to be a, the, the, the crummiest part <laughs> of the whole campus. It was just rock hard dirt and they had a bike rack there and, and, and it was just maybe the ugliest part of the whole campus. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to convert this into a peace garden we recognized we needed a centerpiece. And so my colleague, uh, Will Greenleaf, who was an exceptional teacher, uh, still is. Anyway, he had all of his students launch a letter writing campaign to representatives uh, in the United States government, you know, members of Congress and uh, the president. And the desire was this to see if we could obtain a relic from the World Trade Center and to honor that relic by making it the centerpiece of the Ackerman Peace Garden. So immediately, uh, Representative Hooley had her staff go to work 
on uh, trying to secure a relic. And uh, sure enough, a few days later, I get a phone call uh, from, from her uh, staff person, Suzanne Coons, and she says, we have it, we have your relic. I'm going to plan on the first anniversary of September 11th, the dedication of the Peace Garden. And so to do this, we, you know, naturally it was, it, it was a whole school effort, but we wanted to include our community. And, and in total, what we did was we, we brought all of our first responders, uh, police and fire, uh, in, into this plan. We, we, we actually have a parade of vehicles, police and fire vehicles, and a bus of uh, Ackerman students. We, we all take off and we go to Tualatin, where we're then received uh, at this ceremony at the UPS uh, station. And so they bring out the relic, and then uh, Fire Chief uh, Ted Coons, he, he signed for the package. It was a ceremonial signing for the package, and then the relic was uh, loaded onto fire uh, engine, and, and then our parade returned back to Canby. And what we discovered was um, the Woodburn Fire District and the uh, Tualatin Fire District each had their uh, ladder uh, trucks with the ladders fully raised and this mammoth American flag hanging over the center of Grant Street. And so our, our parade of vehicles pass underneath this flag. It was a very special day, but I'm reminded about how our community um, you know, it, it just brought out the best in all of us. I, I remember constantly uh, addressing with my students is, you know, we can't always control what comes to us, but what we can control is how we respond and how we react. And I think, you know, this was something that my students recognized. Yeah, things are bad, but we can turn it into something good. And, and they did, they truly did. Now is a really critical time uh, with all of the turmoil in politics and the communities and groups opposing other groups. I, I think, I hope that the next generation will look at how can we work together even if we disagree on a politic or a policy at school or you know, we're all in this together. You know, we're all human beings. I and mean, we all want a prosperous and a comfortable life. But we also, I think, have learned, and, and you need to learn, that you've, you've got to make sure that, that the community is secure. It's the old saying, um, you know, those who don't pay attention to history are doomed to repeat it or whatever. Um, you know, I think it's really important that um, people take a long look and reflect on, you know, what can happen, what has happened, and what could happen um, again. Just because you weren't alive when it happened doesn't change the significance of that event. Uh, but to never forget to, you know, like what you're doing, you're interviewing people who are alive during that time. That's amazing. You're, you're keeping the memory alive. Because um, President Reagan said one thing that always stands out. He said, freedom is always only one generation from being extinct. It's not in our bloodstream. It's something that is passed down from parents to their kids through teaching, through talking, through doing things like this, but never ever forget. That's, that's my advice to the generation, to your generation and beyond. We must never forget the uh, firefighters and police officers that knew that day that they weren't coming out of those towers alive. Um, they knew as they were going up the stairs to get people out of those towers, which in Tower 2, they rescued hundreds and thousands of people by going and getting them to the proper stair stairwell mm -hmm. to get them out of that building. And knowing that they weren't going to come out of that building alive. It was terrible and it was tragic, but it also inspired greatness 
out of us as as people, out of citizens that just said, look, I've got to go do this because my fellow human being needs me to step up and help him today. Things will happen in the world like 9-11 and um, you have to know that there are still good people in the world. Um, it really is. It's a lot of good people in the world. My, my boots were badly damaged on the first day of the deployment, and they really were not uh, firefighter regulation boots. They were you know, pretty utilitarian boots, but the soles were badly damaged on the first, first day. It was the first day after the trade center, September 12th, and there was thousands of parcels and boxes coming in from all over the country from good people who simply were sending what they thought might be helpful and be useful. And I found a box with a bunch of boots, um, and there was probably seven pairs of boots. And I found a pair that fit me, and they had steel toes. And in each pair of boots was a little note from a, a gentleman who gave his first name, and his, la his first initial and last name in Brooklyn, New York. And it says, I hope these boots get to where they need to be. And actually, two of my teammates also took boots from this box, and we used them for the rest of our deployment. And I got home and tracked this person down and thanked him and said, listen, so you understand, your boots got to where they were supposed to be and thank you because it helped keep me safe, it helped keep my feet safe, it kept me operational and in the field. And it was such a beautiful gesture on the part of this man who, who didn't even know for sure that the boots were gonna get there and he could only afford to buy seven pairs of boots so he bought seven pairs of boots, typed the note and, and put it in there and I still have the note to this day. So I think the message I would give you is that if you care about something and you feel like you, can, you want to do something, go with that, that gut instinct. You can make a difference, even if you're a thousand miles away, three thousand miles away. Uh, just showing dignity and respect for people, you know, you know, as, as someone who, who, you know, is a Christian, like, you know, I believe that every human being is created in the image and likeness of God, you know, and so, um, and even if you don't believe in God and whatnot, but just to hopefully recognize that about human beings that were that uh, to, to, to give people the benefit of the doubt, you know, to show kindness and respect and dignity to people. Uh, take a few minutes to learn their story before jumping to conclusions or presuppositions about people. And interestingly, the message that I wanted to give and did give at 9-11 is the same message that I've given for the last 18 months. And that is we stand steadfast and we move forward. We acknowledge our pain and our hardship, uh, but we know that we have a God who cares for us and loves us and will get us through uh, the racial tension and violence that we experience going through the, the fires and the, the ice storms, all of it, man, we, we've just been hammered. And, uh, and yet we're here and uh, we're standing on two feet and we're talking to each other and that makes a difference. So keep talking about it. Keep telling your story. Make sure you do that and just be able to communicate a story of hope. I think that is, uh, that's a big deal. It's huge. It's huge. This project was fantastic. I mean, uh, getting to interview some awesome people, getting to hear interviews um, from some really, really, really cool people, um, just special stories that um, gave a really special understanding as to what these people went through, um, what this was like for them, and what they would want our generation to know. I know, like, a whole other side about, like, people who were actually over there, like, before it happened in... <laughs> And like the like people who were there like right before it happened, like who were people who were there like a year before it happened, like they saw what it was like before the attack. Like they know what the Twin Towers look like, what the Pentagon looked like. I thought I knew a lot about 9-11, but actually listening to people's stories, it helped me understand so much more not just what happened, but the feelings that people were going through back then, because now we look back on it, like we've processed it, and like it's all I've ever known. But it was interesting to hear how their lives were before it happened. 
As a whole, I thought it was an awesome project and I thought it was really interesting to get to know everybody's stories and everything. Um, and yeah, it definitely impacted me. Like hearing everybody's stories, I did not know there was that many different perspectives that people had. I made me really think like what I would have done in a situation like that, like if I knew someone or like was around while that happened, like what I would do and I would not have been able to handle it probably as well as he did. I feel like in the generation I'm in, we don't really care much about things, but being in this project and like all these people and seeing all of like the experiences all these people had on 9-11, it really just made me see how much they went through. And well, you see what impacted me was sort of the small world that we live in. Even in this small town of Canby, there's people who are still affected by it. And, uh, you know, going into this, I felt like, yeah, I mean, there's, this is Canby. We're the other side of the, of, of the country. Um, who, who would be, a, you know, who, was, who would be there? It was definitely not what I thought it was going to be at all. It was a lot easier and better than I thought it was going to be. But it, like, impacted a lot of people that really had nothing to do with it. Like, everyone just said they remembered what they were doing, where they were, like, they can remember the whole day. I was able to hear other stories. You know, I've always just heard my parents' stories, their, their perspectives, and hearing other people's perspectives and how they were affected by it, and some of them affected definitely more than my parents, was just a, like kind of an eye-opener. It helps us remember and about 9-11. It helps us tell the story of others to other people and tell them what it was. I asked my cousin if he knew what 9-11 was. He's about nine years old and he told me I don't know what it is so I'd like him to see it I'd like to show it to him and tell him this is what it was and this is what the people have gone through 